software defined or software centric camera. And there are many forms of this. One of them is combining multiple frames together, so called burst mode computational photography. Another general trend is toward using more machine learning in the image processing. And this means replacing classical algorithms, it means large uh, training data sets. Google is very good at gathering large training sets and is very good at machine learning, so this is a technology that we do well. <coughs> Another change that might be less obvious is a move toward less secrecy in our camera algorithms and our technology and more publication. So you might think, well, this means that you're giving away your secrets to your competitors. It is true that we will have to innovate faster when this happens, but what it does allow is it allows us to hire PhD superstars onto our teams for developing the camera. And this has given us a competitive advantage. So machine learning, software-centric, and public publication and less secrecy. So, just a few more ground rules before I begin talking about the technologies. Ground rules about camera apps. They have to be fast. So the viewfinder has to be 15 frames per second or faster. Uh, the shutter lag, the time from when you press the shutter until you get a picture, should be less than 150 milliseconds. And the photo should be ready in something like five seconds. Also, the default mode must never fail. One of the things that we are particularly proud of on the Pixel smartphones is the reliability of the camera. You take a shot, it almost always comes out well. And so um, it's important that it never fail. So of course that's not true. Um, for a while we had a face detector that had 96% accuracy but it would fail on certain corner cases, such as someone wearing dark sunglasses. So that means that when I took uh, a picture of my graduate student, then he had dark sunglasses on and it failed. It exposed for the desert behind him instead of for him. So that picture is a ruined picture. We are now doing better than that using more machine learning and better training data. So uh, of course, there are certain creative modes and failures are okay in those creative modes, especially if the failure is humorous. This is, I believe, from uh, uh, a fruit-colored company's panorama mode, but I think our panor panorama mode could do something similar if the dog was walking for another. Okay, so with that, uh, let's start talking about the technologies. And the first one I'll talk about is high dynamic range imaging, HDR plus on the Nexus and Pixel phones. So this is a published paper about the technology. The basic idea of high dynamic range imaging, in other words, imaging for a scene where you have very dark darks and very bright brights, um, is bracketed. This is what uh, a single lens reflex or SLR uh, user would do. They'll take uh, very short exposures to capture the highlights and very long exposures to capture the shadows and then combine them together. So here's an example of bracketed exposures. And the problem with these is that it's hard to robustly align the images, especially if parts of them are completely white or saturated, like you can see here. And that leads to alignment errors and ghosts, or double edges in the images. And we want to avoid this. So our technology is a little bit different. We instead underexpose every frame and capture all exposures of exactly the same frame length. That sounds like the wrong approach for high dynamic range imaging, but it actually works. By underexposing, we save the highlights, and then by aligning and averaging images, we clean up the shadows. And uh, one formula I'll give you is that the signal to noise ratio increases as the square root of the number of frames that you average together. So if you average nine frames, you get three times less noise. So this reduces noise in the shadows, and then we boost the shadows. So the idea is to preserve local contrast and sacrifice a little bit of global contrast. So what does that mean? If this is a plot of intensity across a scan line, so suppose you're taking a picture of this wedge. You could compress it like this 
but that would produce an image that at least on my laptop looks very hazy uh, this projector doesn't show the effect sorry um, what you want to do though uh, it's hazy because these edges have become lower contrast what you want is instead to preserve the local contrast and only compress the global tonal relationships. This is exactly what the human visual system does as well. And so there's a, a better picture. Reduce global contrast, preserve local contrast. Okay, so here are some examples. Single frame, HDR plus. Go back, single frame, HDR plus. And you can see the way the highlights are preserved. Because we're averaging multiple frames, we reduce noise, and so it's good at low light imaging. So I'm not talking yet about night sight. I'll talk about that later. So single frame and aligned and averaged burst. Single frame and a burst using HDR plus. Marketing pictures. Yes, we won the best uh, smartphone uh, camera in that year that the Pixel, uh, the Pixel 2 came out. Or the, the, sorry, Pixel 1. The second technology is portrait mode. So this is also a publication from SIGGRAPH last year about portrait mode. So the general idea of shallow depth of field is well known. It uh, draws attention to your main subject. It reduces clutter in the background, in the case of the selfie, and it increases the amount of depth in your image. So this also won us uh, the best camera rating uh, for the Pixel 2. But more, what I am more proud of is this award. This is from DP Review. They review cameras and lenses, mostly hardware, but they did the most innovative award of 2017 for software. Another thing that's interesting is that we won this award two years in a row. The first year, if you look at the user forum comments, they say, this is real photography. This is somehow fake. You need a SLR if you want to do real photography. The next year, when we won the same innovation award, the user forum comments were running 80, 20, hmm. Why don't the SLR makers do this also? Achievement unlocked. All right. So depth of field. So this is a slide from my lectures on digital photography at Stanford. I won't scare you with the mathematics. But there's a simple formula that gives the amount of depth of field in an image that's based on the aperture, the F number, the size of a circle of confusion, how much blur you allow, typically one pixel, the distance to the plane that's in focus in the world, and the focal length of the lens, or the field of view of the lens. Let me show you a simple example. Folk dancer in Bangalore, India. Here is the same formula, f4.1. The pixels are two and a half microns. She is 5.9 meters away, and the focal length of the lens is 73 millimeters. So the field of view using this formula should be 132 millimeters, so that's like this. On this projector, which is low resolution, probably more like this. So she's entirely in, in focus, but the background is blurred. That's real depth of field. What cell phone cameras do are a synthetic, artificial depth of field. The typical method is to have two cameras, dual camera, and compute stereo between them to get a depth map that says how far away everything is. Choose one plane that's sharp and artificially blur everything that is on a different plane. Completely artificial, but most people cannot tell the difference. And it helps with the goals that I said earlier of shallow depth of field. So here's a single shot with a cell phone, two cell phone cameras, depth map, background defocus. And you can tweak the, the blur in the shape you want so that it looks like an SLR camera. And there's the depth map that it produces as well. OK, the problem with the Pixel phones is that they have only one camera. 
So how do we do that with only one camera instead of two? We use two technologies. We use machine learning to segment out the people. And we also use what is called dual pixels, which I will explain in a moment, to produce an approximate depth map. We combine the two signals. For the selfie camera, has no dual pixels, but we can still use segmentation. And for macro objects, <coughs> I want to uh, take a picture of this object. It's not a person, so we don't use segmentation. We can instead use just the dual pixels. All right, let's go through each technology. So first, the segmentation. It's a computational neural network. It estimates the probability of a person at every pixel in the image. It's trained on a million labeled examples of people and their coffee cups, ice cream cones, hats, babies, dogs. And here's the mask that it produces. So white means yes, there's a person. Black means no, there's not a person there. And then we smooth it out and snap it to the edges of the color image using this bilateral uh, film. Here's the second technology, dual pixels. The idea is if you, here's the main lens of the camera, so that's, that's this lens. Above every single pixel, so here's one pixel, there's a micro lens. And the way the optics works, you put a micro lens above every pixel and then split the pixel into two halves, the left half of the pixel will see the world through the right side of the lens of the camera. The right side of the pixel will see the world through the left side. So you will actually get two views of the world from different positions. They're very, very close to one another. So it's stereo with a small baseline or separation between the cameras of about one millimeter. But it's enough. So here's what that looks like. So can you see that the background is moving very slightly? So I rotated the camera so it's up and down instead of left and right, but it's the same idea. That's enough difference to compute a depth map. So there's the depth map from that very small stereo pair. Okay, <coughs> now let's combine them. We've got a person segmentation, we've got a depth map, we can use it to produce a defocused image. The rule is keep the person entirely sharp Blur in proportion to the distance from the person using the depth map. And what we do that is not realistic at all is we keep a zone of depths around the person completely sharp. It's not physically correct, but it helps non-experts to take good pictures. If you have an SLR, you know that it's very hard to take a shallow depth of field image. You have to focus on the eyelashes and then the nose might be out of focus. This helps novices take better pictures. Here's, let's see, so there's the background defocus for that example. So here's a better example to show this non-realistic zone of good focus. This is a Russian Orthodox priest in his chapel in Antarctica. And yes, I did go to Antarctica to take that picture. And so you can make a plot of distance away from the camera and the amount of blur. Here is the plane of no blur, the in-focus plane. That's what an SLR will do. What we do instead is something like this. We keep a zone of depth that is entirely in good focus. And we only begin increasing the blur in the background and in the foreground. So that his beard's in focus, his nose, his hair, his ears, even the patch. Only the background is out of focus. It's not physically realistic, but it makes it easier for novices to take pictures. Marketing examples. <laughs> A colleague at uh, Stanford, this is Kurt Akeley, who invented OpenGL. More examples. I like to get up in the morning. My form of ego surfing is to get up in the morning, log on, and see what pictures are on Instagram that people have taken using our technology. That actually gives me personal satisfaction. Oh, this is a picture I took yesterday at uh, Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Park. 
I have no idea what this flower is. We don't have this flower in California. All right, so a, a change from pixel two to pixel three is that we have replaced the classical stereo algorithm we use on the left and right sub-pixels with learning, machine learning. So the input is red, green, blue, the left sub-pixel and the right sub-pixel. The output is a depth map. The training before this should be a better depth map. Where do we get a better depth map? We carry around this Franken phone that has five cell phones in it, each with a different viewpoint, and that gives us a very good depth map. And so we have many, many thousands of pictures we've taken with this Franken phone <coughs> in order to train this machine learning. So here's what this looks like. When it says stereo depth, that means pixel um, two, and when it means learning, that's pixel three. We now have it operating on pixel two as well. And you can see the difference here. Those vertical elements are incorrectly sharp in the stereo depth, but they become correct and put at the right depth for the learning based solution. So, how far can cell phone cameras go? General question. I've shown you how we have more or less solved the dynamic range problem. I've shown you how we can improve the signal to noise ratio. I've shown you how we can simulate shallow depth of field. What about the narrow field of view of the telephoto lens? So, this is an area in which, right now, single lens reflex camera is still better. If I go uh, to Arctic instead of Antarctic and I want to photograph a polar bear, I would like to have a very long lens to keep me away from the polar bear. But what can we do computationally? Can we do anything at all? And so here's a technology um, that we've described so far only in a blog called Super Resu. And we introduced it with Pixel 3. And it is computational photography, multi-frame super resolution. Here's how it works. So normally, every camera that you have here has a red or a green or a blue pixel at every pixel site. Not red, green, and blue at every pixel site. It's called a Bayer mosaic. And so you don't have a red here, and you don't have greens here, and you don't have blues here. This has to be computed using interpolation. So two thirds of every picture you take with an SLR is manufactured information. It's made up by interpolation. So you could get around this by taking the camera and shifting to four different positions. And that would give you a red at every pixel and a green and a blue at every pixel. Some cameras, if you put them on a tripod, can do this so-called pixel shifting. Um, on a Sinar camera, it's called um, micro-stepping, but it requires a tripod. What we've done is we've used that same idea handheld. So um, when I hold a cell phone, especially if I hold it out here, it's shaking all the time. It is shifting by itself. And so we can allow that shift over a burst, <coughs> over a number of frames, to produce a red, a green, and a blue underneath every pixel. And so we can accomplish the same thing that the tripod and the micro-stepping accomplishes. What happens if I put this on a tripod, or if I prop it here like that, then we have to do something else to shift the lens. And what we do is we use the optical image stabilizer. Inside our modern cell phones is something that moves the lens by a small amount. So you can sort of see it shifting. If you have a pixel phone, try this afterwards. Walk up to a window and put it against the glass and pinch zoom all the way. You'll see it doing exactly this. It's wiggling all the time. So this is pinch zoom maximum, and this is without, and this is with the multi-frame super resolution. And here are the rivets on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, with and without. So this is not. AI-based super resolution. We're not making up any details. It's strictly multi-frame based on the natural handshake of the phone. How good is it? Roughly the same as a 2x optical zoom. Maybe not quite as good. It is ultimately limited by the diffraction spot size of the lens. 
So if you wanted to zoom to 10x, this technology would not get you there. Okay, last technology is Nightsong. So this was also introduced with a Pixel 3. We have a blog. We don't yet have a publication on this. And we uh, have shown images. They're not, <laughs> the uh, iPhone is not quite this bad. This is again these projectors here. <laughs> uh, no, the iPhone is not quite this bad. <laughs> yeah, this is not bad. <laughs> anyway, this is based on a uh, prototype I actually wrote myself called SynthCam. You can find this C in the dark video online. Uh, here are the technologies that are inside the Nightsun. So first of all, we capture up to 15 frames after the shutter press. So it's no longer zero shutter lag. So you press it and then it captures the frames. Um, we also have AI-based motion metering, which tries to decide how much is moving or, or how much are you shaking. If you had coffee, it will take shorter frames. Uh, if there's something moving in the scene, it will also take shorter frames. If you put it on a tripod or put it on the table, it notices that and it will take longer frames. So here's the, uh, here's the shorter frames part. So yeah, the dog is moving. And this uses a longer exposure and this uses a slightly shorter exposure. If it's on the tripod, here is uh, handheld, here's on the tripod, you can see more stars in the, the, in the case of being on the tripod. We use several align and merge technologies. We use uh, HDR plus, uh, uh, sorry, we use super res zoom on the Pixel 3, and we use HDR plus on the Pixel 1, 2, and 3a. And the difference is only because of computational uh, resources, how fast the processors are. But they do almost the same thing. So we do have a learning based white balancer. This is um, a very good example of AI. So <coughs> here's an example. This is sodium vapor lights, I think, and this is learning based white balancer. So let me dive into this a little bit. Uh, when the Pixel 3 was launched, there was perhaps some misunderstanding. Oh, the AI is making up the colors for you. And suppose it was only trained on red fire hydrants and you saw a yellow fire hydrant, would it color it red? No, nothing like this. All it's doing is estimating the color of the illumination, the light falling on the scene. So this looks blue to you, but is it blue because the snow is blue? Or is it blue because it's white snow <coughs> illuminated by a northern blue sky? Well, you're intelligent and experienced, so you know it's probably white snow. And this is an example of what an AI can tell us. Here's another example. I took this picture in the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Five seconds later, I took this picture. Same fish. This is an unlikely color for fish in an aquarium tank. So an AI that's trained on many training examples should be able to tell me this is not correct. Or this is not the likely color for human skin, no matter what restaurant you're in. So again, we have an AI, it's trained on a million examples of well-balanced images. Um, and what it allows then is, it doesn't choose the colors of individual objects, it just helps adjust the illumination of color. Uh, so the last technology is tone mapping, to make it look more like nighttime than daytime. So here's an example picture. This is taken with an SLR and it has a very long exposure. Uh, three minutes, and this looks to you like a nice daytime scene of Yosemite, except that you can see stars. So this is the middle of the night. The meadow is green because it's illuminated by the moon. These shadows are cast by the moon. Now you're thinking to yourself, wait, there are no colors at night. Of course there are colors at night. The physics is exactly the same as during the day. Humans cannot see color at night because the cone cells in our retina stop operating. But the night is just as colorful. <coughs> so how do you communicate to the, to the person who receives the photograph that it's a nighttime photograph? So if you go back to Western illusionistic painting from the Age of Enlightenment, they had a number of techniques. They would enhance contrast, 
the projector's doing a good job of that. They would drop shadows black. So all the shadows here are very black. Again, the projector is making this worse. And they would surround the scene with darkness. There's no question in your mind that this is illuminated with a lantern or a candle, candle in the middle and that everything else is dark. So we tried to do this as much as we can with um, night sights. So here's an example that um, someone took. You can see the stars. It's obviously a nighttime picture. Um, these are publicly available on, the, on our website. Um, interestingly, most we thought that most people would use night sight between three lux, which is street lamp at night, to point three lux, 0 0.3 lux, which is, I can't find my keys on the floor without a flashlight. Where most people are using night sight is from three lux, street lamp, to 30 lux, which is cityscape at night, like this one. And people seem to like it for that. It makes the city at night seem a little bit brighter and more colorful. But it can also do landscapes. Without night sight, below the landscape after sunset, it would be completely black in a cell phone picture. But this looks colorful. This scene is illuminated almost entirely only by the candles. There's some purple something going on there, but it's, he's illuminated almost entirely by the candles. And this is something Night Sight can do. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <音樂>那我們開心就是跟馬克思科技來討論大家分享一些多項手機影片的相機應用那現在等一下大家我們場外也會有就是Pixel手機的展示 因為我就是比較好奇是Google的手機裡面是沒有專業模式這種選項的那它是不是一直代表說Google和Pixel團隊是覺得宗教有一天是AI會取代真正的照相技術 No, um, the existence of a professional mode is purely a product decision We are uh, focusing on um, the average consumer. We could have a pro mode. Um, if you look at the pro mode of a number of our competitors, they will drop back from burst mode photography to a single frame. And actually their pro mode looks worse because of that. Our ability to save raw does the alignment and average of the burst but does no tone mapping at the end, and so saves that as a raw image. So it's a better raw image than you will get from the pro mode of other phones. We could also add manual controls, but it has simply not been a priority. And no, I don't think that uh, an AI um, replaces a professional for photography. It would still be useful for some niche applications to have more control. No, the um, Pixel Visual Core is used in HDR Plus. Without it, it is simply slower. No other difference.那個一樣是那個比較扣的問題那個之前之前也有提到說呃不過開罵了一呃 Um, our priority has been prioritizing for pixel phones uh, and so 
Um, it might be possible, but uh, I cannot comment on product roadmaps. Whether we decide to or not is a complex decision, having many factors besides the technology. So, do you feel it's necessary the next time? What is necessary? Uh, Oh, no, without the Pixel Visual Core, it's simply slower. So, uh, that's a good question about video. Um, this is expensive computational photography. It's software centric, which also allows us to innovate fast. Um, in order to address video, we may need hardware acceleration. So this could be considered in the future. So uh, I like that question. Yes, you absolutely need to learn from past experience. And in fact, my own personal background is uh, training in art. Before I have a degree in computer science, I had a degree in art. Uh, I was uh, in the College of Architecture at Cornell University. And so I learned many of these things. Absolutely true. I like that question. <laughs> Well, the Pixel does not have a super wide lens on the back. It has a super wide lens on the front. And I cannot comment on future product roadmaps. Okay,我有一个是软件问题,就是刚刚提到那个技术不需要那个VTV可以做,是不是意味着这背后用的机器学习技术是用在天的Flow上面,所以是不是任何可以把天的Flow的设备硬件可以执行这样的技术,例如在
一手三，一手三 A 跟一手三要做到一样的拍照效果，但是他们硬体不同，大概花了四，大概花了多长时间去进行调教？Um, that's a good question. So, as、um, the computational algorithms become more complex, it takes longer to develop them, and、uh, so it is frankly a race, always a struggle, to、uh, prepare the software features in time for the launch. And it also means that there can be updates from year to year, or even during the year, and it will get better with those updates. There is also, therefore, a desire to have the algorithms portable from year to year, so that, for example, we could ship Nightsight on Pixel One, Two, and Three. And so, yes, this is absolutely a constant struggle for us. But I should say, it's also an advantage. Because it means that we don't that we can innovate and produce new features without waiting for hardware to be ready, and hardware,、uh, especially chips, have a very long development cycle of several years. Software can be done in much less time, so it's both an advantage and a challenge. Well, would you keep on the one camera photo design in the upcoming months? I cannot comment on product roadmaps. <laughs> You knew the answer to that question. As of current, we're still trying hard to use software to imitate real cameras and real photography. But I think that as time moves on, it will be、uh, people will will use real cameras less and less. So they will start to not really understand what a real camera looks like. Do we really need to keep、uh, imitating it, or are, are we are we starting to look at say, the、uh, the the night mode is already something that real cameras can't do? What do you think about this?、Uh, that's a very good observation. So in my photography class at Stanford, the first time I talked about high dynamic range imaging, I showed as an example Trey Ratcliffe、uh, from his website Stuck in Customs, and、uh, these are very extreme surrealistic images. And I said, "Okay, this is not the correct way to do high dynamic range photography. Let me show you different algorithms." And all the students in the class, said, "No, no, no, no! Show us more that looks like that. We really like the way that looks." So that was an important lesson for me:、um, that there is、um, definitely a factor of taste in photographic image processing. Of course, a, a photographer like Ansel Adams would immediately agree with that: the straight photograph. Does not look like his final print. There is a lot of manipulation that he does in the darkroom. So this is this is already true before digital photography, and certainly before computational photography.影像辨识，或者是说 AR， 或者是说其他的深度学习的应用，这可能是不是用在相机？它可能是用在其他的理想的使用。Trying to remember exactly what's public and what's not.、Um, our learning-based white balancing is already in Google Photos. So the answer is generally yes, and I cannot remember exactly which things have launched and which are public yet. But the answer is yes. Uh,就是讓畫面看起來更自然 更真實那就是代表說以後這個技術會分成兩方向一個是看得更清楚一個是給人看的話就是看起來更真實更自然的那另外一個是什麼話給人看的話就是可能要看更清楚譬如說就是很黑暗中那他可能就是看得什麼都
Yeah, so it's a, um, let me answer it two ways. Some of the technologies that I described for aligning and merging bursts of frames to reduce noise would be useful in computer vision systems. So a self-driving car would benefit from something like that as an example of computer vision. Or a, a Nest home camera would benefit from something like that. The aesthetic decisions, the tone mapping, the white balancing are perhaps less important. It, it really depends on the particular goal that you have. And um, the tone mapping for night sight is certainly an aesthetic decision that is perhaps not important for computer vision. But so it's not a single clear answer, yes or no. Some of the technologies are relevant to computer vision. Some are less relevant. Okay, um, every the quality of the picture is always a combination of the hardware and the software and the AI. So um, yes, if we had um, if we had a very long telephoto lens, I described 10x for example, we could do better than we can with only the 1x. It is always going to be a mixture of hardware and software. 那所以未來還會趨勢就是可能會像是其他家廠一樣就是會是多個鏡頭嗎或者是就是做一些比較特殊的那個設計。Same question again. I cannot comment on product roadmap. Sorry. 好,那還有任何問題嗎?我們可能時間關係,再開放。那想請教一下現在因為很多廠牌都想要拖鏡頭那但是過管是堅持在我們的軟體的運算方面那可以談一下說就您的觀點在硬體方面局限還有軟體方面局限現在看到的目前無法突破的技術是什麼 Limited, yeah, so well, the limitations in hardware are the same limitations that every cell phone maker fights with if you want to do a very long telephoto lens, as an example, you need a thicker phone or you need to fold the optics. So we cannot escape from these laws of physics, although there are many forms of uh, innovation. In software, it's a good question, and the main uh, limitation is compute power and memory. So better processors will always help the software-centric approach. And maybe hardware acceleration of the software for certain applications, but basically faster processing. And for machine learning, which uses large models, more memory. Um, Mm, oh, exactly the opposite. Um, by allowing the average person to take better pictures, 
I think that we help their creativity. And um, so the picture that I showed earlier of the flower at Chiang Kai-shek Memorial, I uh, struggled to take exactly the right picture and I stood there for a long time. If I had a camera that could not take a good picture, I would not try to exercise my compositional creativity by moving around from place to place and trying to make a better picture. So I think it enables more creativity. The greatest example I can think of now is at rock concerts. 30 years ago, everyone would hold up a, a cigarette lighter. Now everyone holds up the cell phone. We, we uh, remember things because we take pictures of them. They're a part of our psychological makeup now. I was there because I took a picture of it. So it's become very much a part of our psychology and our creativity. Okay. 所以，呃，有两个回答这个问题。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。它可以是一个结合，电脑和软件，但电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些领域，比如像电脑，电脑永远是重要的。在某些in the aesthetic look, whether people like the images, in how well it can do white balancing, it's almost entirely software. So it varies depending on the, which feature, how important the software is. Mark, 